get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And some past episodes people should check out. I had Moise Navone of Mobileye. Um, he talks about the Mobileye journey of being acquired by Intel for $15.3 billion. But you know, Steve, what struck me was a long, it was it was not like just an upward slope, right? He had to go back at times and tell his kids and wife and pull them out of extracurricular activities. There's no more eating out because of the the bumps in the journey. And I, I love hearing those, those real stories behind and um, other amazing Chicago entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm gonna introduce today's guest in a second um, is check out the interview with the founder of RX Bars, Peter Rahal, um, Johnny Immerman of Immerman Angels, who started one of the largest network of cancer survivor mentors in the world. And Steve, you're not like this one um, because it relates to this conversation, which is Perry Marshall wrote Evolution 2.0. And I interviewed him about breaking the deadlock between Darwin and design, which basically he explored the debate about evolution, science, faith, and does God exist? And that was a really fascinating interview. So before I introduce today's guest, uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Um, Rise25, uh, we help businesses connect to their Dream 100 relationships and give to their network of people um, by helping you run your podcast. You know, for me, Stephen, uh, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at a way to give to my relationships and profile the people I admire, the companies I admire on and shout it out to the world so other people can find out about it. And I've seen over the past over 10 years, podcasting is one of the best ways that I've seen to do that personally. So if you have questions about it, you want to launch your, and run your own podcast, we can help you. We're an easy button for people. Go to rise25.com. And today's guest, uh, Steve Sarowitz, is a founder and chairman of Paylocity. And, you know, he started with three people in a 600 square foot office, and he took it to over a billion dollar company. Went, they went public, and it's a leading US provider of payroll and HR solutions. He also serves as CEO of Blue Marble, which is an international payroll provider and director of Payscape, a UK payroll provider. And He's an international philanthropist who plans to give away over a billion dollars to charitable causes during his lifetime. And him and his wife have a family foundation which support over 50 worthy causes worldwide, helping orphans, foster children, refugees, and many more. He's also helped produce several movies, uh, including The Gate, um, Cloud, and I blame you, Steve, for making me stay up too late last night because I was up on YouTube watching these things. and. Before I know it, it's three in the morning. So, um, Steve, thanks for joining me. It's my pleasure. So my I first wanna... question is, does, which side of God did he end up? Is he a believer or not? Believer. Okay. Yeah. I mean, part of the book he talks about, he, he think he gives the example in the book, I believe, that if you take a scrapyard and take a tornado, and would it create a jumbo jet? Like, would the chaos of a tornado, just randomly put a jumbo jet together perfectly. And he's like, there's some higher power that has to put things in order. And that, that's what he talks about in the book. But he comes at it from like a very, he's an engineer by trade. So he comes at it from engineering approach. But I know before we hit record, you said something interesting, which is you, you kind of combine religion, philanthropy, and business all in one, right? So what do you mean by that? Well, I'm a very passionate Baha'i, and so my philanthropy is really uh, influenced greatly by the Baha'i ideals, the Baha'i writings, and the same thing with business. So I became a Baha'i uh, just under six years ago, almost six years ago to the day, uh, February 10th, 2015. And I, at first, I didn't see the connection. I thought, well, I'm a very passionate Baha'i. I'm not going to do much in business because I'm not interested in that. I'll just teach the Baha'i faith because I didn't need money anymore. I, I could just walk away. And over time, I've come back to business realizing I have these talents and that God gave me these talents and I can use these talents, but I can incorporate my faith into business. And in my company now, my latest iteration is Wayfair Studios, which I'm partners with the wonderful Justin Baldoni, who's coming out with a new book called Man Enough. 
in addition to directing clouds, which you mentioned. Yeah. And it's a Baha'i, it's a, it's a company that's inspired by Baha'i ideals. And so we actually just listed that to all our employees last week. So we went over the values of the company and then we gave them some Baha'i writings, which backed up the values. And we're not trying to convert our employees to be Baha'is. We've told them they can be anything they want, but we're saying this is a value that's important to us. And this is a value. So for example, honesty and other things and integrity. Um, and so these Baha'i values, um, women being equal to men, diversity is very important to us. So one, the idea that we're one human family. So all of these values are translating to the business itself. For uh, people who don't know Baha'i, can you give okay. just a brief introduction? Yes. Uh, so those who are in the North Shore of Chicago might recall the beautiful Baha'i Temple. Beautiful. And it's absolutely beautiful. This behind me actually is in Israel. This is uh, the Baha'i Gardens in Haifa, Israel. Baha'i faith, um, we would describe as Baha'is as the latest chapter in God's eternal faith. So we as Baha'is don't believe that Moses was wrong and Jesus was wrong. We believe that all of the prophets of God, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, are true prophets. Their religions are true religions and their teachings are right. And the latest version of this is from Baha'u'llah. And what Baha'u'llah said is he was the promised one of all faiths. And his message is that we're one human family, as I said before. Get rid of racism, get rid of sexism, get rid of nationalism, get rid of religious prejudice, all the things that divide humanity. And he said it's not only possible to do this, but inevitable that we will do this and unite as, as, as a single human race. Baha'i, so Baha'is like me are, are terribly hopeful, even in, in some dark times that we're going through. We for Studios, how does that link to? Baha'i. So both Justin Baldoni, my partner, and I are Baha'is. We met through the Baha'i faith. Uh, I, I met him when I consulted with him about the gate. And uh, Justin is, is a very public Baha'i. He's, he's far better known than I am. He played a character called Raphael on Jane the Virgin, and he's directed a couple big movies. So he's the celebrity. I, I'm the, we, we talk about this. I'm the money and he's the fame. Uh, but we are just great friends and we really share these ideals and the things I mentioned, uh, the things we're promoting, way, it's Wayfarer, like a uh, traveler. Wayfarer, and, and most of the employees at Wayfarer are not Baha'is actually, but they understand where we're going and they share these values. And, and that's very important for us as Baha'is because we think we're one human family. It's not like we need everyone to be Baha'is. We wanna just spread these, these teachings of oneness. And so that's what Wayfarer is doing. Yeah. If people don't, aren't watching the video, listening to the recording audio, um, you have a shirt on. I do. And this, this is, is from Wayfarer. Yeah. Actually, this is from our charitable arm, uh, which we are looking at me potentially changing the name. Uh, but the, the main slogan is be love. Hmm. And, you know, I was watching an interview with um, Rain Wilson, uh, better known as Dwight Schrute. And so is he also Baha'i? He is a Baha'i and a very good friend of mine. I adore Rain. And we're looking actually at doing a project with him with Wayfarer right now, which I'm really excited about. We, we haven't uh, signed the deal yet. I, I'm, I'm really anxious to sign the deal so I can tell everyone about it because it's a film we're looking to do with him. And I'm just really excited about it. And he was in the gate, by the way. If you saw the gate, you might have noticed that Rain was in the gate. But he's a, he's a super person. He is a Baha'i, he's a lifetime Baha'i, as is Justin. They're not newbies like me, but uh, they're both tremendous people first, Baha'i second, and then of course they're good friends as well, both of them. Yeah, I want you to talk about, uh, I'm gonna have you talk about the gate a little bit, but um, the people can check out uh, Clouds on, I think Disney Plus, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I remember hearing that song, listening to that song, um, it must have been like 2010, like actually when, I mean, when Zach, or was that when the song came out? It was when Zach yeah. was still alive. Okay. Whenever, yeah. When it came out, um, how did the clouds come about? So, um, Justin actually did a documentary about Zach when he was still alive for my last days. And this actually was what, uh, kicked off my last days, which became a very successful series. Um, it was about people dying. And so leave it to Justin to do something to take this potentially morbid subject and make it joyful. 
and hopeful, although serious. And so Justin did a wonderful job with this and, and many others. And he kept in contact with the family. Uh, Zach's mother wrote a book and Justin wanted to make the movie for years. The rights went different ways, eventually came back around to him. Um, and by the way, just speaking of Rain Wilson, the original documentary was a partnership between Rain and, uh, and Justin. Mm. The movie was not, but the, the original partnership was in my last days. Um, so Justin uh, eventually was, was given the rights to direct this movie. And here, here's where the story gets interesting because he was just a director for Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers was gonna short us a little bit on our budget, which is very typical. And Justin went to them and said, I have some money now. We had just literally ink drying on the paper created Wayfair Studios, which I, so I could invest in movies. And Justin said to Warner Brothers, well, I've got an investor now, your partner, and I have some money. I'll make up the shortage. And Warner Brothers, not surprising, said, oh, no, no, we were just kidding. We'll give you whatever you want. Or, you know, we'll give you the extra million dollars. Nice. Justin said, um, no, actually, you know, if possible, we'd really like to be your partner. And we'd really like to buy into half the movie. And Justin and I figured that would be the end of it. We never thought Warner Brothers would take us up on that, but they did. And so we ended up being 50-50 partners with Warner Brothers. And at the end of it, COVID happened. And what happened, we ended up buying Warner Brothers out and selling it to Disney Plus. And it's just been a, it's been a phenomenal success. Disney's extremely pleased with the result. And I love the movie and the story and Zach and his family. Yeah. Everyone has to check it out. Definitely just, just Google it and listen to the song on YouTube. There's, a, there's a, so many videos and you mentioned My Last Days. There's a bunch of videos on YouTube for that, but check out the movie clouds on disney plus um and so we're kind of going in reverse order then we'll go back to your your business journey days but the gate what came about uh tell us about the gate so i became a baha'i as i mentioned uh six years ago and three days after i became a baha'i i emailed my friend who's also in the payroll business to talk about a little connection there and i said farshud i'm a baha'i now and i jumped up and down as high as then 49 year old man could um, <laughs> jump, not very high. And I, and I said, I'm gonna just teach the Baha'i faith. I'm done with business and I'm gonna do that the rest of my life. And he said, well, you could do that and you could maybe reach hundreds of people, but if you made a movie, you could potentially reach millions of people. And so less than an hour later, I got an email from a man by the name of Peter Samuelson. Now, he's made about 25 movies and Peter's most, uh, well-known movie is called Revenge of the Nerds. Gotta yeah. love Revenge of the Nerds. Yeah, it was funny because when you said that with Rain Wilson, he he basically said, <laughs> his fun fact is like, well, I met Booger or something like that. Oh, really? Yeah, he's. Well, that, that would be a typical Rain statement. Rain, yeah. Rain is really funny. When I try to make jokes, Rain just tells me, leave it to the profession. <laughs> so, totally. Anyway, so I, uh, Peter, wants me to do this foster uh, thing with foster children, a nonprofit thing, nothing to do with movies. And I ended up doing it. Uh, so I ended up working with Peter and his, his wonderful nonprofit, First Star. And I ended up going out to California about a week later to talk to Peter and I mentioned the movie and he said, oh, come talk to me. And so I told him about the movie and it turns out we were actually outdoors at Santa Monica and right next door to us was a table with another two people. And one of the two people at the, this, the table right next to us, he had also been talking to someone about making a Baha'i movie. The odds of that were about a trillion to one because there's not a lot of Baha'is. And although it's, it's higher than that in LA because producers, you, know, you just have to walk down the street to find a movie producer. But still, it was a little odd, I thought. And, I, and I, so it started me on this odyssey, a three-year odyssey. We started in 2015 and the movie came out in 2018. We shot it in Spain. We shot uh, interviews in London, LA, and Chicago. And we shot the end of the movie right here behind me. We, we shot the last uh, week. We shot our narrator right here at the Shrine of the Bot. It was absolutely fantastic. And the movie came out. It was named the best documentary. Uh, we got a Wilbur Award for that in 2018. It was, uh, it's been shown twice nationally on ABC. And we now have well over a half a million views on mm. YouTube. So we are, you know, I would say millions of people have seen the movie now. Yeah, that's amazing. Why did you call it the gate? Um, the Bob means the gate. So the Bob is 
um, in Arabic means the gate. And the Bab is actually the gate. So from a Baha'i perspective, and I think just from a perspective in general, the Bab was the gateway to a new age. When he declares on May 23rd, 1844, it changes the entire world. It's very quiet. People don't know about it. Actually, it wasn't that quiet in, in Iran or in Persia. He had over 100,000 followers. They, they jailed him. They ended up shooting him very publicly. Um, his shooting, you'll have to watch. Have you, you did watch The Gate, right? Part of it, yeah. Not the whole thing yet. Watch The yeah. Gate again, and you'll see about his shooting. It's extremely dramatic. I'll just say this. They shot him 750 times. Oh. And in front of a crowd of thousands, and he disappeared. And this is very well documented. He told them before they took him that they couldn't shoot him. He wasn't done with his mission. They end up finding him back in a cell. He says, oh, I finished my mission now. And they tie him up a second time along with the niece who was tied up with him the first time, also wasn't killed. And they had to get a whole other regiment, and they shot him. So his shooting was very dramatic. His, his, um, his ministry is also very dramatic, but not very well known outside of the Baha'i faith. But we believe he was the gate not to this new age and also the gate to Baha'u'llah, who we believe is really bringing the ideas for this new age to humanity, the ideas of unity and oneness. See, talk about your background, your wife's background, because you obviously, you said, you know, you started on this journey six years ago, and it's got to be a, something profound to change what someone's, you know, how they grew up their beliefs. Um, talk about where that started for both of you. So my wife is Catholic. She hasn't changed. I'm, I was Jewish. Um, my, so my family has been Jewish for, you know, thousands of literally thousands of years, 19 members of my family were killed in the Holocaust. So I was told even beyond being Jewish that I would betray my family if I ever changed religions, which is not really something I was even thinking of doing, <laughs> but I had that deeply ingrained in me. And I'm, to make it even worse, I'm named after my great grandfather who perished in the Holocaust. So mm. I literally named every name. He was Shmuel Yitzhak Sukiovich. Wow. So for me to change religions was a big thing. It was a very gradual process. When I was in college, I first heard about the Baha'i faith. I loved it right from the start. I really liked the idea. It made sense to me. It never made sense to me that the Jews were right and the Christians are wrong or the Christians are right and the Jews are wrong. I mean, the idea that there was only one God and he sent all the messengers, that just immediately when I heard that, that just made sense to me. But going from there, from that, you know, hey, that makes sense to becoming a Baha'i was a much longer journey. The next step, um, a friend of mine, when I was in my mid-20s, uh, asked me to study the Christian Bible. And I had a Chinese restaurant at the time. He was a delivery driver part-time and a full-time pastor. And I said, no, I'm, I don't really want to study the Christian Bible. I'm Jewish. And so he asked me again. And I said, no, I'm Jewish. And the third took three tries, but I finally agreed to study the Bible. And after a couple of months, I'm like, well, I kind of like this Jesus guy. I don't know why I don't believe it. And what does that mean anyway? What does it mean to not, do, that, that, do I think he didn't exist? Or do I disagree with something? And I, and I really didn't disagree with what he was saying. And as a Baha'i, I kind of realized, and this is probably going to sound controversial, but Jesus and Moses were the same person, essential. So Moses and Jesus, their teachings are so incredibly similar. When you really go back to it, Jesus is quoting Moses in all of his most important statements. And we, we as Baha'is believe that all of the messengers of God are essentially one soul and, and that the teachings, the spiritual teachings are identical. And so I think to be a good Jew is to be a good Christian. To be a good Christian is to be a good Muslim and to be a good Muslim is to be a good Baha'i. This idea to me is so much more logical. And, and, you know, the question I always have for people is if we don't think this way, how are we ever going to get to peace? Which, look, if we had peace. So the next, you know, would the world be better if we had world peace? I think so. And, and are we worshiping the same God? I hope so. And if we are doing that, why are we fighting? And are these, you know, not these religious traditions? I mean, I, I love the Jewish religious tradition. My wife is Catholic. I respect the Catholic traditions, and I've been to Mass many times. I have, I have no problem going in, and praying in a Catholic church or a Jewish temple. No problem at all. I like to pray. I like to say, you know, to, to thank God, no matter where I am, or say praise to God. I just don't think we need to separate ourselves with identities that way. And that's yeah. that so many problems in the world. I yeah. mean, Israel, Israel behind me, you've got a couple problems there. Based just on a religion. few. Yeah. Yeah. But not in Haifa, by the way. Haifa's, Haifa's the chill city in Israel. 
and and so is Akko. The places where the Baha'is are just coincidentally seem seem to be a lot more mellow. Steve, thanks for sharing that. And I'm curious. So your great grandf my grandfather actually was a Holocaust survivor, and um, your great grandfather uh, perished in the Holocaust. Who survived from the family? Well, so my great grandfather sent some younger brothers over, and he sent three sons over. And so my grandfather was one of the three sons he sent over. Mm. The younger brothers sent $10,000 to him to take the family out. And they put in the bank. The bank uh, folded the next day. It was a very uh, un unstable time financially. And so they, they all perished. They couldn't get out. It was very, very sad. The, the actual, the younger brothers were very wealthy but they couldn't do anything at that time. You know, they sent them the money, but they just couldn't get them out. It was too late. It's terrible. Um, I wanna go back to your journey uh, from your career and even backing up from there, right? I mentioned 600 square foot, uh, a couple staff, no clients at the time. When you were growing up, what did you wanna be? Oh, I, at one point, I wanted to be a baseball player. Um, I wasn't until much later I wanted to be an entrepreneur. My mom wanted me to be a college professor. I don't think I really wanted to be anything. I think I, if I could have been a professional runner, I've always loved to run. So um, I just ran before this interview. I just ran about an hour or two ago. Um, so I, I love to run, but I'm not good enough to be a professional runner, unfortunately. I was always okay, but not good enough to be professional. I read um, somewhere there's you have something uh, Hall of Fame in Chicago Runners Association or what is that? Well, I'm a, I'm a very good big runner, so you can't tell this from looking at me here, but I'm six foot six, so mm. I'm I'm one of the taller competitive runners you'll ever meet. And for my height and my weight, I'm very fast. Mm. But the key thing is for 200 pounds. And so like a 200 pound runner is like a a five foot two basketball player. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, yeah we, we, they're just we're handicapped. So take me back to the 600 square foot office, a couple of staff, no clients. What was the idea at that point? Um, so I had worked in the payroll industry. I got in 1989. I worked for a company called Robert F. White. I didn't even know what a payroll service was. And it wasn't until years later, I found out my grandpa, one of my grandpas did payroll full time. But I never knew that until years later. Um, I worked there as a salesperson for a couple of years. The company was bought out. I sold. I, I then uh, started a Chinese restaurant, failed miserably. A got Chinese restaurant. And, Why yeah, Chinese yeah. restaurant? Um, because of my ethnic background. Why else? <laughs> well, Wayne told me to leave the joke to something else. Um, I wanted to do like uh, Chinese food delivery, like, uh, like Domino's Pizza. Okay. That's a long story. Well, we, we talk about that another day. But anyway, just, just it was called Yin Yang's Orient Express, and it was a colossal failure over time. It took two and a half years, uh, six years for me to probably fail. And I'm sorry, six months for me to fail and two years for me to to go on beyond that. Got it. Um, I, I've, I've always been very stubborn. Um, so I got back in the payroll business in 1994 as a sales manager worked for a couple companies. And in 1997, I started Paylocity. Uh, my accountant, I'd worked, the, the last two companies I'd worked for, the owners had sold out for multi, they became multimillionaires upon selling their company. And my accountant said, you should do it for yourself. So I, that was it, just go do it for yourself. So I did, you know, little did I know that that, would, that that decision would make me a billionaire. I had no idea. What were some of the milestones? So like, you know, from no clients, what's the first milestone that you remember hitting for the company? Well, our first client, which took almost, that took several months. We actually didn't have revenue for the first few months. The first milestone was getting the, the payroll system to actually calculate a check properly. That took a couple months. We, it was a brand new system. Um, I, there were a few nervous days because we had, we had put in this brand new uh, system we'd licensed and it didn't work for a couple months. So getting the system to work, helped. A um, couple big steps along the way. One of the biggest steps was deciding to write our own software. So this is about five years in. I, okay, uh, milestones along the way. The first time we made the Inc. 500 is one of the uh, country's fastest growing um, companies. That was big for us. And then the same year, 
uh, we actually made the Inc. 500 two straight years, 2003 and 2004. And those same two years, we were also named the number one independent payroll company in the country by our, our industry uh, group. So those, those are kind of milestones. Along that same time, we're hitting the size and I was looking around and I was seeing all my competitors and I realized up above $10 million in revenue, almost nobody licensed their product, they owned it. So I started thinking about that. And so we started writing software then and that decision to write software, that was a very big expensive at the time decision, but it's been, I mean, that has changed my life. Um, and then the next milestone would be bringing in Steve Beauchamp, who's the current CEO. I brought him in in 2007. I would not say that Steve is comparable to me as a CEO, because that would be a tremendous insult to Steve. He's, he and I both know, no, I'm not kidding when I say this. He and I both know that he is 10 times the, the CEO that I ever was when he's asleep. Um, so, but we, we each have a lot of respect. We're good friends. Mm -hmm. and I have tremendous respect for him and he respects me and understands that I'm, I, I think probably the biggest thing he respects is the fact that I acknowledge that I'm not a great CEO. Um, I've become better over the years. Actually, I'm probably a much better CEO today or could be if I wanted to be than I was back then. Yeah. But he's just, he's, he's a naturally great CEO. He's done a tremendous job leading the company and he acknowledges that I'm a good entrepreneur. So it works out and you know, it's good that we kind of respect each other's relative strengths. Yeah. I mean, it's a different skill set, right, Steve? So yeah. what makes him a good CEO? He, he's very strategic. He's very thoughtful. Um, He's very even tempered. He is a he's a ready aim fire guy. You give Steve information, he goes and gets the information. He's 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 first of all brilliant. He's got good intuition, great logic. I mean, really unusual com great integrity. I mean, just if you want to like look at what you'd want in a CEO, just put put a poster of Steve Beauchamp up there. As far as I'm concerned, I think he should be winning awards as one of the best CEOs in America. I, I think he's that good. Was that a tough decision? I know, I remember reading at around 150 employees, you kind of made a decision that you needed uh, a change. What, what brought you to that decision? And would you have done it any differently? Would you have done it earlier? Um, I think I did it about the right time. It's worked mm -hmm. out very well financially. I could have done it earlier, um, but I think doing it that time, I think it was the right time. I took it as far as I could. I think had I brought him in earlier, I might have had regrets. You know, I didn't. But by the time I brought him in, I knew I needed to bring him in. Um, How did you know? Like, tell me, what were you? When well, you I was said, physically, yeah. I was physically getting sick. Um, it, I was trying to run the software development area, the customer service area, the operations, um, sales. Uh, you know, I had some good people too, but. I had to be involved in every decision. Again, that's uh, nothing against the people I had running those areas. It was more me um, not being as good a manager. And so because I was doing that, I had two young children at the time. I was physically, and we had two lawsuits going on at the time. Everything I'm getting stressed thinking about, thinking about yeah, it. it was, yeah, it was, I was not sleeping enough. I was very stressed out about the lawsuit. So the, all the stress got to me. And my digestive system, my digestive system at that time just kind of was blown up. Wow. And so I went to doctors and I was, I'd also hurt my back. All of that was stress really related. And so at my, the bottom of it, I, we hired uh, Mike Caskey, who's now a uh, president in 2007. And his first question to Steve, this is how bad I looked back then. This is going back uh, 13 years, four, almost 14 years ago, 13 and a half years ago. Uh, Mike's first question to, to Steve was, is he going to live? That's how wow. bad I Wow. He was serious too, because I was very pale. I just was, you know, my body was shutting down. And frankly, had I stayed like that, who knows what would have happened? Maybe I wouldn't have lived. You know, I could have had other medical issues that have, would have come up. But it, I um, ended up going to a medical intuitionist right around that time. Hmm. And she diagnosed me, told me to take out gluten, um, dairy, and nuts from my diet. I found out that nuts in particular were really tough on me. And I didn't know that. I'd never known that. I was allergic to peanuts when I was a young kid, but then after that I was fine. And it turns out that it come back around. Wow. And once, once I removed those from my diet, I was much better, much more, much, very quickly and, and removing the stress out too. And then when I called Steve up, it's a kind of a funny conversation. I, I said, Steve, I, I want someone to come in as, as COO for my business because I need someone to help me. 
And he says, well, I would only consider president. I said, I meant president. <laughs> How said, did you know Steve? Um, so I've known him from the industry. And I told him always, if I ever wanted someone to replace me, I'd call him. I told him for a few years. Now, meanwhile, Steve didn't care about this at all. I, and, and Steve will tell you this if you ever have to. I mean, I got to tell you, like Steve, is, I, he's, he's wonderful. If you ever get a chance to interview him, please do. But he will tell you he had no desire to come take over my little tiny company at the time. I mean, we got along well, but that was he was doing great on his own. He had been president of a small payroll company. That company was bought off by a larger one, which in turn was bought off by a larger one, which was the second largest one in the world, which is Paychex. He was a vice president of Paychex. He was making very good money. His, he and his wife and four kids under six were all doing very well in Rochester. His wife was happy. And to uproot them and come to Chicago was a big thing that he was not even thinking about. It just, I, I got very lucky. Um, I brought him in for an interview. I told him he was my only candidate. And uh, so he, he um, interviewed and he, he was surprised because the company was about twice as big as he thought we were. He was even more surprised. And what really impressed him was our software product. He did not think that a little player like us could make a very good product. And we had, because that was really my forte was technology. In addition to sales, I had a very good grip, grasp of technology, much more so than most of my peers. And I actually did some coding. I, I actually wrote the prototype myself, which was very unusual. Wow. And so I was very passionate about that. Um, and the operation was much more solid than he expected. But that still wasn't enough to convince him. He ends up going, the reason he even came for the interview is because paychecks had blown him out for uh a seminar they were having. So he gets seated um, at the same table as the, as the paycheck salespeople for Chicago. And they said, hey, Steve, you know that tall, skinny, crazy guy who, who runs um, Paylocity? You know, all the other, they called us ankle biters. They said, all the other ankle biters act this way, but, you know, we can just crunch them, but we can't do that with Paylocity. We keep losing to them in the marketplace. And Steve had seen our product and he knew our product was just flat out better. And so he knew that what he saw was that we could replicate this all over the country. He and I had that same vision. And, but I knew that he could, he could actually execute on that vision, whereas I couldn't. And so we worked together side by side for the next few years with Steve taking over more and more. He pretty much ran the company from day one, but I, took, I, I was running software development for a while. After a couple of years, I gave him software development. And then we actually were moving on to the new product. And so I was very involved in that for the next couple of years. See, for after that meeting that he heard the Paychex people talking about Pelosi, what point does he call you and say yes? Or how does it actually come to a yes? I think within a few, his wife had to come out. Yeah. Uh, Steve, if you ever interview Steve, Steve will tell you um, that I almost blew it, you know. <laughs> What'd you do? <laughs> um, I think we picked her up in an old Paylocity. I think I sent one, somebody to pick her up. Like, you know, she's, you know, it wasn't, we didn't exactly wine and dine her, but then she saw my passion and she realized I was a pretty bright guy. And I think uh, Steve, Steve will tell you, I almost blew it with his wife, um, but she's, she's great as well. Um, it was within a week or two. I, he, what he saw, the, it wasn't just the meeting. He really saw the potential for the company. And, I think he could see the vision of where we are today back then, 13 and a half years ago. Yeah. You know, I remember listening to one of the talks you gave, Steve, and you kept saying and really hitting on competitive, competitive edge, competitive edge, competitive edge. And one of the things is the software. And in the beginning, you license the software in the beginning, which, you know, it seems like a smart move because it saves in cost. It's probably speed to market. And then you decide to create your own. And you talked about being profiled, but profiled, I think it was in Forbes for the wrong reasons. Ink Magazine. Ink Magazine. Well, Ink Magazine. I would love Ink to do a follow-up. You know, <laughs> you're talking to people at Ink. I've waited now for all these years. We have to do but, that. So Ink, Ink Magazine wrote this thing and said, you know, and it was funny because the experts weighed in and basically said I was a moron. Now, I, I was very proud of the decision because I put a million dollars into the product and I immediately said, at the, well, not immediately, I, I actually, we analyzed it. And, I, and when I, once I heard that the product we put in a million dollars into wasn't gonna be great, I said, stop. Well, you know, I, I basically asked my new head of development, should we start over or not? And he said, start over. And I'm, you know, okay, do it. 
well, I didn't hesitate. And I thought it was a really good decision. The results, I think, speak for themselves. I mean, the company being worth, I think, over $11 billion today. And it wasn't worth that much then. Right. Um, I mean, it really wasn't worth anything then. Um, I think we made the right decision. Um, and so, yes, we lost a million dollars, but I think we made it. I think the proof is in the pudding with that one. Are you listening, Inc. Magazine? Yeah. I can do a follow-up. You know, I mean, they, they talked about wasting a million dollars, but but really when you, it sounds like you're like, we have to go back to the drawing board. You used everything you learned to build a better product, it sounds like. We did. Um, we did use everything we learned. And I, I learned, biggest thing is just, you know, hiring the team. I knew who to hire, what I was looking for. I had never built software before, so it's, it's not unusual to fail. Software is hard to build. There's a reason why these, you know, people say these tech entrepreneurs are lucky. No, they're pretty darn smart. It is hard to build good software. You know, so I can tell you now, I mean, I have challenges. Every company building software, even though I've done it, you know, in Blue Marble, we have challenges with our software. And I have a really good team, but it's just, it's a hard thing to do. What There's was your idea? time to do it. Yeah. Steve, what was your identity like when you bring in a, um, uh, he was a CEO at the time, right? Steve was, was considered the CEO or president. I what was you, president. I was CEO. You were CEO. He was president. What did, you know, what was your identity like? Because you're used to so just working around the clock, doing everything. Was that hard for you? Was it not hard for you? What did that look like when you brought in, brought in the president? I was happy to bring him in again because I was sick at the time. Yeah. So I needed it. I, 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 it wasn't, and that's why, like I said, it might a couple of years earlier, I probably wouldn't have brought him in a couple of years earlier because, but I'd realized I needed him. So it was surprisingly easy. Steve and I, and we've been working together now for 13 years. I mean, technically I don't work there anymore and we don't work together, but I'm still chairman of the board. And we've had one time where we were mad at each other. And, and you know, maybe... I, I can't speak for Steve. He might have a little, a few more times than me. But we actually, you know, when he left Paychex and they, they heard where he was going, they literally thought he'd gone insane. And they told him so. They were not shy in telling him that. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Here he is leaving a, an excellent job with, you know, already making great money, great career track, potentially going to be CEO of this beautiful multi billion dollar company. And he's going to this little company and the entrepreneur is still there. What, what made it okay is I was prepared to give the reins to Steve. We had a little bump in the road a few years later. Steve wanted to be CEO. I wasn't ready to give up the title. And I remember I was at um, a meeting. Uh, have you heard of YPO? Yes. So I was at my YPO meeting and I said this. And one of my friends who's still my friend, still in my forum, says to me, so uh, let me get this right. Your CEO and he's president and he wants to be CEO and, it's, and he says, well, you know, are you a good CEO? I said, no, I'm terrible. Is he a good CEO? Oh yeah, he's a great CEO and he's doing all the work of CEO. But what do I do if he's CEO? He said, well, you could be chairman and founder and then the CEO still reports to you because you still own the company, right? I'm like, yeah. Okay. So he says, you are going to name him CEO. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and so I went back and I, I named Steve CEO and he was very happy. and. You know, Steve's point to me was, well, who would hire you as CEO? I mean, I'm a CEO and this is good for my resume. Just in case anything happens, I should be CEO and get credit for the work I'm already doing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you probably should. But he's, yeah. he's very happy with, you know, what's happened. He's worth a good amount of money himself now. He's not a billionaire, but he's, he's, he's very wealthy now. He's done very well. And I think that it's safe to go back to those people with paychecks who said he was crazy and hopefully... He could convince them that he was only half crazy. Yeah. So ink and paychecks, you know, things turned out. Um, yeah, I had Sean McGinnis on who um, was, I think he was president of YPO at one point. I don't know if you knew him. Uh, but talk about some of the lessons learned going public. Well, um, hire a good CEO and let them do all the yeah. work. Um, <laughs> It's um, interesting being chairman of a public company. You know, I can't say too many things, but I was already CEO of a company, of a decent sized company. So, you know, the, as a CEO, there's things you cannot say. And so it's interesting to me. Um, I just had a, a talk with an employee today at, at uh, Wayfair. Uh, and he said, oh, I bought some Wayfair. I bought some Paylocity stock. I said, 
That's it. I'm not talking to you about velocity. I have a really hard and fast rule. You know, I don't, I tell all my friends, don't buy velocity stock. My really good friends or, or partners, because I, I don't really want to be in a position where if you make money, someone could point it back at me. Right, right. You know, I just, just make money somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> I'm very, very careful about that. And so I'm very, very careful about talking about the company. Um, luckily, I don't work there, so I don't have that much knowledge anyway. But as a big inside holder, I have to be very, very careful. And, and, yeah. I, and I think that, I think it's good that there's very strict rules about that because I don't want to, you know, have my family and friends make money because of something I know. You know, let, you know if they want to buy Paylocity stock, they can. I don't want to hear about it. And so that's the biggest thing is that I just, I just feel that insider trading, I'm, it's something I'm really uh, cognizant of. The other thing that made it very difficult is now I have blue, I had started Blue Marble. And so I had to be very, very careful with related uh, companies. And, you know, still it's, that's an issue if I were to sell Blue Marble. Paylocity has first dibs if I were to sell Blue Marble. So I, had to, I just have to be very, very careful to do everything above board. And the most important thing to me is that I do everything ethically and that never, never Paylocity. And, and as chairman, that's, very important. When you, um, Steve, when you kind of stepped down from responsibility and day-to-day -day work with Paylocity, what was your next venture? What did you do next? And how much time did you leave? Um, Blue Marble. So, uh, yeah. 46, so I'm 55 now. When I was 46, going back nine years, just under nine years ago, I went to Steve. I said, well, Steve, you know, I don't have to work. You're doing all the work here. I'm pretty much done. You know, you're paying me a, a paycheck, but that doesn't matter. And I don't need money. So what can I do? He said, well, why don't you start an international payroll company? We'd had a bad experience working with international payroll. There wasn't really a good international payroll company out there. So that we could put a point to at that point. And so we um, decided, Steve said, you'd be good at that. Start your own. Because I wanted, I, I said, what kind of company should I start? And so he said, well, international payroll. There was a couple different um, types of ideas I had, but that was the one that I thought was the best. And so I started this in uh, basically right around uh, eight years ago, very beginning of 2013. How much time did you give yourself to take a break or did you before starting well, the next I thing? Of, I kind of already taken the break because Steve was carrying most of the weight at Paylocity. So mm. At, you know, at the time I was probably paying, playing Scrabble a couple hours a night, I was bored. I wasn't a Baha'i yet. So I, if I'd been a Baha'i, I'd just spend two hours reading Baha'i books every night. But um, I was already kind of going, for me, going much easier. And so, and even when I started Blue Marble, it wasn't a lot of work. I never have put that much work into Blue Marble. Blue Marble's actually been a pretty good success. We, we made the Inc. 5000 list, um, which is nice. And uh, we uh, we've grown pretty well. We're actually going to probably do 17, 18 million dollars this wow. year in revenue from congratulations. Uh, wow. 2017, we did a million five. So we've grown well. Wow. So it's another successful company, but I, I won't take a lot of credit except for the fact I think Blue Marble is more innovative than Paylocity was. It's more it's more unique in what we've done in our vision. But uh, I probably could have put more time into the company. What were some things you did to grow? Blue Marble, knowing what you knew from Paylocity? Well, I think with Blue Marble, I had more money to grow it. So I was able to invest in sales. I was in, able to invest in marketing in a way I couldn't uh, with Paylocity. Same thing with software. I was able to start building software day one. So part of it is just having a lot more capital. Yeah. I mean, some people, I could argue, if you gave them the money, they wouldn't know what to do with it. So you deployed it in a, a very smart way. What did you well, do with sales and marketing? I would tell you that, and Steve Beauchamp would tell you, see, he looks at me in 2017 and kind of says, what the heck are you doing with your money? You're throwing good money after bad. Between two, my first five years in business, I managed to get to a million and a half in revenue and we were losing four and a half million. Now this year we should make money on our 17 or 18 million. So it's a little different, but uh, going back just a few years ago, we had, you know, we were coming off, so we had $6 million in costs and a million and a half in revenue. That's not so great. Um, so it really depends on when. I kind of, I, I watched uh, the story of Pixar and I think I kind of did what Steve Jobs did. We, I kind of had 
faith that the business would come around. That was probably the biggest thing I did right is I was patient. And I said, I know this is a good idea. I know if we do it long enough, it'll be a good idea. And so I held on and I knew that at some point in time, people would realize what we were doing. And um, I hired uh, Victor Lobo, uh, who's been running uh, sales the last several years. He's our VP of sales and a personal friend. Actually, I'd hired him previously in, at Velocity um, years and years ago. And then he left us and went to work for ADP. Because we not because we actually wanted him to leave, but because he left and went to San Francisco, mm. and so we at the time didn't have uh, we didn't have a position for him in San Francisco. So um, he he um, he left ADP and came and came in and started running Salesforce. And he he figured out that we needed to put more money into marketing rather than into sales. Well, into marketing and sales, and so that marketing push that he that he put in really helped. What did that look like? So marketing. <clears throat> what we needed to do is we needed to have people calling us. Um, international payroll is not as big as uh, domestic payroll. Domestic payroll, you can walk down the street and there's 100 people who need domestic payroll. International payroll is much more spread out. It's harder to find the clients. And in a sense, you have to have them finding you. And people didn't know we were there. So we did a lot of SEO. We did a lot of uh, ads and things like that to start because people needed to know, because it, it was too hard to find them. And once we started doing that, that really helped. Who's an ideal customer for Blue Marble? Uh, someone with probably a thousand employees and maybe a, you know, 150 or 100 international employees, uh, maybe five, 10 countries. Some, I would say, you know, not IBM or, or Google or Microsoft with tens and tens of thousands of employees. You know, we, we could do, and we do have clients with five or 10,000 employees or more, but typically I would say with between 50 and maybe a couple thousand international employees is really our sweet spot. Is there a certain industry that it tends to skew? I would say, you know, actually on the low end, maybe even 10 or 20 international employees. Mm. We, um, we always were going for more the mid-market of international. So not the, not the biggest and not the smallest. Hmm. Like uh, manufacturing type of companies? Or what's a common company that has? We don't have a, we don't have a concentration. Um, hmm. it's, it's spread out on many, many industries. Got it. Okay, awesome. Steve, first of all, I have one last question or two, two like kind of a subset, but two last questions. But thank you. First of all, thanks for sharing your journey. Thanks for sharing your stories. Um, it's just a tremendous journey from religion to movies, to business, to philanthropy. And I, I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And um, people can, you know, check out bluemarblepayroll.com. Uh, and uh, is, what's the, the, the URL for the Wayfair Studios? Where can people check out the movies? Um, I think it's wearewayfair.com, but don't okay. hold me to it. Okay. You can Google Wayfair Studios. I should know that, but I don't. Wayfair Studios and, you know, check out Clouds, The Gate, and some of the other works that they do. Last two questions, Steve, is really, I always ask, since it's Inspired Insider, what is, what's been a low moment, a challenging point in this journey? And then on the flip side, what's been a high moment, like an especially proud moment for you on the journey? With Paylocity, um, early on, I had a partner and, and I had to fire my first partner. That was a really tough, challenging time. It was very early in our growth. and I wasn't sure the company was going to survive. On one room, I had bankers. Um, in, in, it was only a two-room office with 600 square feet. In the other room, I had my network consultant um, frantically trying to break into our computers because my, uh, my former partner had locked me out. Wow. Of, our own network. It worked out okay. And I ended up buying him out. And so it wasn't, but it, you know, sometimes things seem, sometimes things seem a little darker than they are. I've learned over time, you know, the lawsuits was another low moment. I had having these two lawsuits going on. One was a trademark lawsuit. One was uh, a software they sued, they'd sued us for software infringement, which we had not done. And we had ended up, I tried for six months to get a hold of the CEO of the company and finally gets a hold of me and he says, I need this much money. And I'm like, okay, sure. And then we hired a consultant to come in and do an audit. And at the end of it, he says, much ado about nothing. And I knew that, but it was really hard and frustrating 
um, because all he had, if he had just talked to me six months earlier, we could have just resolved this and I could have said, look, I'll pay for an audit. We didn't do what you think we did. And I proved it and I was willing to prove it, but so that was kind of tough. Um, yeah. high, high moments, those first couple of real successes at Paylocity, Clouds is a high mo moment, uh, getting the Wilbur for the gate is a high moment. Um, going public was a high moment. Um, what about um, your wife and your foundation for philanthropy? Talk about yeah. some of that. Well, there's um, some really high moments, and I haven't talked a lot about philanthropy. Let me talk a little bit about, you know, my philanthropy is all about in. So there's two types of philanthropy in my mind, and there's more than this, but I'll give you. One is the Band-Aid philanthropy. You cut yourself. Somebody cuts themselves. You, you say, oh, here's a Band-Aid. And then they cut themselves again. You give them another Band-Aid. And, and, rinse, repeat, and you just do that nonstop. And so if I'm merely helping the poor, but not understanding why they're poor, I'm merely helping the orphan, but not understanding why they're orphans, that's Band-Aid philanthropy. Sounds good, and it's a good thing to do, because look, you know, it's always good to help your fellow man. But I want to know why people are poor. I want to know why there's inequity in the world. And as a Baha'i, and this is really where my Baha'i beliefs come in, I believe that these divisions that the Baha'i faith is fighting um, racism and sexism and nationalism and religious prejudice are underlying all of the major problems in the world, poverty being a big one. And so my wife and I focus a lot on education. And so our family foundation, which is the Julian Grace Foundation, no, please don't call us because we are we don't accept outside because the second I say I have a foundation, sometimes we get a flood um, of people. But our foundation, we help over 100 nonprofits and, and we do a lot of work in education. We do help our orphans. We do help foster children. But a lot of what we do is trying to eradicate racism and sexism. Uh, we, we work with a, a wonderful uh, group that helps uh, women, uh, refugees, female refugees. So we, different organizations that do different things. The idea being that we're trying to get to the root cause wherever possible. And then the last uh, year, I've broken off a little bit of my giving outside my family foundation, which I'm now going to do through the Wayfair Foundation. And all of this is 100% Baha'i inspired. Not all Baha'i organizations. So, for example, we're giving to uh, one organization, actually multiple organizations that fight racism, which is a Baha'i thing. But it's all with Baha'i ideals. And a lot of it has to do with it's a combination of philanthropy and, and the Baha'i faith. Steve? Thank you so much. I want to be the first one to thank you. Check out all the, you know, Wayfair Studios. Check out Blue Marble, Payroll.com, and uh, more interviews and Rise 25. Steve, thanks so much. It's my pleasure. I'm always happy to talk about almost any subject you want. And uh, I highly recommend if you get a chance to interview Steve Beauchamp, uh, interview him as well. He might be harder to get on than me. I'll just ask his wife. No, I'm just Oh, and, and check out, make sure you check out uh, Man Enough, which is my partner Justin's book that's coming oh, out. Cool. It's a huge thing. It's uh, examining his masculinity. It's going to be an international bestseller. It's already come out hot, the pre-sales. Hmm. Um, it's going to be big. So you're going to hear about it all over. Okay. But I'm telling you about it now. It should be coming out in April. Um, he is, uh, he's, we've already got a TV show called Man Enough, but this book is going to be huge. Man enough. It's something, it's something that's really important. How do we men, how do me and you and other men um, survive in this new world where women, for some reason, think there are equals that we're supposed to, you know, what am I supposed to do in this new world? How do I become, am I, you know, am I a macho man still? Or am I, do I have, am I, you know, do I have to give up all my masculinity? You know, how do I survive? And it's really trying to balance in this new world, what we're supposed to do. And it's, it's a very important book. And I think, I think Justin is amazing. Everyone check out Man Enough. So right now it will be out in the near future. Maybe when you're listening it is already out and I'm sure they can check it out on Amazon. It's pre-sales right now. It'll be out, I think in April. Okay. Man Enough. Mm -hmm. Steve, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other